1959 was a milestone year for Pontiac styling. If you like big cars with fins, that is. Along with a nice set of tail fins, the designers gave Pontiac two styling elements that have become synonymous with Pontiac. Its split grill and the wide track stance. Contrary to what a lot of people would like to think, wide track was not an engineering development. It was not uh, conceived to make the car a better handler or better balanced or better ride. It was purely a styling exercise. Even with wide track styling, performance continued to be the key word in Knudsen's makeover strategy. The engine lab punched out Pontiac's power plant again in 1959, this time to 389 cubic inches. The hottest version now made 345 horsepower, an astonishing 112 horsepower gain in just three years. By now, the Super Duty engine program was on a huge roll. With car builders like Smokey Eunuch and drivers like Fireball Roberts, Pontiac's thundered a victory at race after race. In February, stock car racing entered the big leagues. The 1959 Daytona 500 would be the first race on NASCAR's new state-of-the-art high bank track. Qualifying speeds were averaging over 135 miles per hour. But the Pontiacs were capable of running at least 10 miles an hour faster than this. Rim riding at 145 miles an hour, Fireball Roberts has passed 34 cars in one of the most amazing rides ever seen on a racetrack. Despite its obvious speed advantage, Pontiac didn't win the Daytona 500 this year. But 100,000 race fans saw a sight they would never forget. Pontiacs running rings around Ford, Chevy, and Chrysler. For Bunky Newton and his engine wizards, it was the reward they'd been waiting for. I can remember watching that one of the first 25-mile races on television. I guess that was the first one that was televised. And, and uh, my stuff was on those engines, so that, that was quite a thrill, you know. Almost 400,000 Pontiacs sold in 1959. Thanks to fresh styling, awesome power, and a full-bore marketing push, which redefined Pontiac as young America's performance car. Even though the production line Pontiacs didn't have all the Super Duty parts, the ad guys made sure you knew that those race-winning cars were powered by the same engine you could get in a new Bonneville. Sort of. The term Super Duty, believe it or not, never got used in advertising. You'd use the term like especially equipped or, you know, with, with special performance options and so on, but never used the term Super Duty. That was strictly a kind of an internal term. By now, Super Duty parts were finding their way onto the streets and the drag strips. Jim Wangers thought getting Pontiac involved in drag racing was a great marketing idea. Well, I was able to convince the Super Duty guys that they should start to take some of these parts and make them available to the drag racers because stock car drag racing was really coming into its own. Wangers even got into the act himself. He helped build a factory super stock racing team at a Detroit dealership called Royal Pontiac. With Wangers driving, Royal's hot chief Catalina won the stock eliminator class at the 1960 U.S. Nationals. Going into 1961, Pontiac had momentum. Being out front was fun. And the only thing more fun was having a bigger lead. Stay with us as the Super Duty program shifts into high gear on the American muscle car.